What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Mainstream Media Shills. Today, I've got a good one for you. I think I always say that, but this is a pretty good one. This is a story that I was actually supposed to be included in. It's a BBC article written by Carrie Allen and Sophie Williams with indirect help from the U.S. State Department. I'll get into that a little bit later on. And I'll also provide you with resources to understand how these kinds of journalists are the ones promoting real genocides for the purposes of furthering their own careers. Now, while nobody ever really wants to be included in hit pieces like the ones that uh, BBC wrote here, I was actually kind of looking forward to being included because... I obviously know better than anyone else why I do what I do, why I say what I say. So being able to see them firsthand make twists and turns to represent it as anything else would have provided a really great example for us to work from when exposing uh, these kinds of journalists and the kinds of tactics that they deploy. I have a couple of theories as to why they finally dropped me from their story. The first of which is that, especially on Twitter, I speak a lot about topics that have essentially become media blackout areas when it comes to mainstream media outlets like the BBC, at least. These include things well beyond the China discussion, whether it be the missing details behind the Soleimani assassination, the blocking of uh, Syrian embassies uh, throughout Europe to prevent Syrians from voting in their most recent elections and the subsequent protests afterwards. You know, the the largest strike in human history that happened in India not too long ago and the strategic photos and shots to cut out images of the communist flags that were being waved around and so much more. By including me in this article, they might have drawn attention to many topics that they go through an incredible effort to avoid and to just not talk about. The other theory is that I had been... Uh, actually quite polite with the BBC journalist who contacted me up until the point I saw the kinds of questions they were asking the other subjects who were to be included in this article as well. I then became quite a bit more harsh. And I think they probably got the sense that I'd lash back quite seriously. And I think they knew that I could see right through their disgusting little grift because I laid it all out in black and white. And I don't regret one bit being harsh with these mainstream media shills though, these are opportunistic sellouts. They're the kinds of people who enable genocide after genocide, atrocity after atrocity, and continually prop up American-led aggressions and brutal sanctions. They're not talking about the children dying all over the world because of these Western sanctions on poor countries. They're not talking about how American sanctions target specific ethnic groups or countries also known as genocide, depriving them of the ability to acquire food and medicine, not letting up even in the face of suffering in a global pandemic. They're not talking about the implications behind a Mexican company being punished for uh, punished by America for sending uh, drinking water to Venezuela during their water crisis. They're not talking about the true intentions of sanctions, specifically around its design to cause human suffering so that either people rise up against their own government or in the case of terrorist hit regions, boost recruitment into extremist groups, a point very important to keep in mind when you consider America also delisted ETIM as a terrorist organization recently. They are pushing the exact same kinds of propaganda that is reused over and over again to now try and do the same thing in Xinjiang, not moving the bar on quality of evidence required to justify such brutal and genocidal programs in even the slightest way. Not, not even in the environment where we have sufficient information to truly understand the criminal nature of these sanctions. In this article, they even tried to conclude that because there are a few people fighting back against this propaganda, that it's too miraculous to be not called coordinated. Really? The entire mainstream media can go out to the world with the same message against China. And that's not called coordinated. But any reaction to that is what you're going to call coordinated. It's not just that some people are able to see through your bullshit now. It's not that some people are tired of being fooled by you over and over again. It must be some sort of a conspiracy theory to undermine you and your outlet's journalism, which you've gotten wrong so many times on geopolitical issues. Seriously? <laughs> now, in this video, I'm not going to really focus on going through the article bit by bit. There's an outstanding video on the YouTube channel called um, The New Atlas. 
And it goes through the article in a far more calm, cool, and collected manner than I'd be able to do so right now. So I highly recommend that one. I'll put the link in the description for you guys to check it out. But what I'll do now is I'll first go through my exchanges with Sophie Williams. So it started out by uh, her reaching out to me on Twitter with the following message. Hi, Daniel. I'm a journalist from BBC World, and we've, we're keen to speak to foreign vloggers in China who make content about political issues along with pieces of their uh, life in China. I saw the SCMP piece and we're interested in getting your personal thoughts and views. Is this something you'd be willing to speak to us about? If not, no worries. So after this point, I looked through her work to see what kind of a journalist she was. And she didn't seem to really have jumped onto the anti-China bandwagon in any major, in any major way, at least yet. And she actually even lived in China for a while once posting that she joined a Facebook group with expats from Beijing and she described what she saw as repulsive. That was really encouraging to see. There are some pretty disgusting group chats in China with expats who make really nasty comments about locals and even joke about rape. The most famous of these kind of dingy groups is called uh, CCJ, China Circle Jerk. And um, there's actually a couple of YouTubers who pretty much exclusively focus on uh, Ch uh, China hate who were involved in these groups as well. And, you know, these are the kinds of folks who dehumanize China and its people and are just incredibly racist. Seeing Sophie recognize this problem gave me a bit of trust in her. So this is how I replied to her. Hi, Sophie. I'm interested but cautious. The SCMP reporter reached out to get my comment before the article was published, but it was clear they already decided what they wanted to write, and my involvement in providing additional comment wasn't something they were really interested in. Furthermore, depending on what the questions are, I suspect my answers will be unlike anything I've ever seen or expect to ever see published in its correct context by the BBC. No offense to you. I'm sure you're a fine journalist as I've seen from your feed. You seem quite fair and objective. I'd be interested to find out a bit more about what you had in mind in the format. I've refused interviews with over 20 Chinese uh, media outlets since my video was pushed by China's spokesperson because their audience will more or less agree with what I have to say. I'd rather reach audiences that disagree. And suddenly being propped up by Chinese media after my speech will probably hurt rather than help in relation to my goals of allowing people to see a different perspective when it comes to what I believe is a dangerous escalation of concerning uh, propaganda. But if I don't see the value in speaking to Chinese media and I don't trust Western media, I'm a, in a bit of an odd predicament. So I suppose I ought to start taking some risks. Once again, let me know what you had in mind. So after this point, Sophie replied with, hi, Daniel, do you have an email address I can contact you on? Thanks. But before I responded, Lee and Ollie Barrett published the questions that she asked them. And here they were. Let's take a look at them. Let's take a look at a few of them. Um, your videos are part of a disinformation campaign to spread communist party rhetoric. These are, these are apparently, they said, please respond to these allegations and questions below. Your videos are coordinated to counter-investigate reports by independent media outlets on the treatment of China's Uyghur community. Many of your videos started out as simply navigating expat, expat life in China and now have become fiercely political. Why is this? Um, you... Uh, let's see here. That's a long one. You you have been appear you have appeared in CGTN Media Challenge Challengers. I think she meant to say campaign. How does CGTN approach you, and were you paid? Yeah, right. Respond to these allegations made by whom? Barry, actually, you know, from uh, YouTube channel uh, China Best Ch uh, uh, Best China Info, was also asked very similar questions, and he asked them directly. He said, "Who exactly? Who's making these allegations?" And he didn't get a response. They, what it looks like to me is they pulled these out of thin air. They just made them up to antagonize these guys. They weren't out to have meaningful conversations with any of us. They didn't really want to find out why we have the perspectives we have. Do you think they'd ask questions like this to the guests they're interviewing who are agreeing with the mainstream media narrative, no matter how problematic their connections were? No, of course not. They will uncritically prop them up as expert opinions, and I'll prove that to you in a moment, looking at nothing other than this very article in an epic example of what sellout journalism looks like. You would think that after they got it wrong so many times in terms of the geopolitical kind of narrative, 
you'd think the fact that because the domestic trust in the UK and the BBC is at record lows, you'd think that after people started going to alternative media outlets or started listening to people on the ground directly through pr platforms like YouTube, the BBC would decide that maybe it's time for a new approach. Maybe we should engage these people who are becoming more and more popular in a respectful and honest way. No, of course not. They don't want to legitimize us. We are slowly chipping away at their dreams to shill whatever it is they need to shill in order to receive a nice salary from their state-sponsored news agency while they ironically try to discredit YouTubers for potentially being state-sponsored in China without any actual solid evidence or sense of irony as they try to make this case. So worked up they were by us that they actually even admitted in their article that they reported some of our videos to YouTube. So for now, let me continue with my reply to her after I realized how this interview was being framed. Hey, I saw your questions to the other China vloggers. After seeing the framing of your questions, it seems I was wrong about saying that you seemed like a fair and balanced journalist. To me, it seems like I'm witnessing the birth of a new BBC hack. You went from being excited about seeing your work show up on a BBC breakfast TV channel to wanting to accomplish more. Looking at BBC's work on China, I can understand why that probably involves you requiring that you finally sell your soul. When you tweeted that you joined an expat in Beijing group and what you found was repulsive, I had false hope about you, recognizing how disgusting the average foreigner's narrative on China is. Instead, it looks like you're in the process of becoming something far more disgusting than the average white racist sexpat you find on the streets of China, or in these groups, I should have said. You're becoming part of the very system that produces the filth that believes China is a country made for using and abusing with bullshit narratives and to provide an excuse for bigoted foreigners in the West to assault and abuse overseas Chinese while still sleeping well at night. I'll answer your questions if you prove that the BBC is a worthy outlet that deserves any respect to begin with. Because right now, it seems a bit like a dumpster fire, which survives on dictatorship-like policies requiring every person owning a TV in the UK to fund your filth. Even, through the public, even though the public trust in your organization has dropped to record lows. Answer these two questions, and I'll answer yours. One, why did the BBC try to lie about BBC World being regulated by Ofcom in a, in Ofcom in a foreign affairs press conference meeting in Beijing? Two, why has the BBC not responded to the public push asking why they didn't do their due diligence on the Tersene Ziawadin concentration camp survivor story, which has been revised multiple times and has critical holes? Passport renewal date, for example. I hope I'm wrong about you, and I sincerely apologize if I am, but by the framing of your superficial questions to other China vloggers and your association with the BBC, please excuse my skepticism. If I'm right about you, I feel sorry for you that whatever life has thrown at you, that it put you in a position pushing you to become another average BBC hack just so you can get ahead in life. Thank you. Later on, she responded, Hi, Daniel. I was writing to give you the opportunity to respond to claims about your trip to Xinjiang. If you wish to uh, do so, please provide me with your email address. Keyword was, I was writing you to, I was writing to give you. So my reply was, I hadn't even bought my flights yet when you first messaged me. Now we're going to pretend that you were contacting me regarding my claims about my trip to Xinjiang? I'd like to make sure I've interpreted your reply correctly. Despite your connection to the BBC, you are refusing to attempt finding an answer to my question regarding the BBC's outright lies and dishonest reporting before I engage with your questions. Despite that my inquiry is directly related to the very topic that you'd like to engage with me on. The change.org petition asking the same question had 4,000 plus signatures. It was mysteriously taken and was mysteriously taken down. So it'll be very useful and important for my reporting to understand and confirm that even after asking a BBC connected reporter with whom I have an open direct line of communication with, who is also covering the China Xinjiang topic for the BBC, has also refused to comment or respond to this issue. Are you indeed refusing to comment or respond? Her reply was, Hi, Daniel. Initially, I intended to speak with you regarding your videos. However, the piece has changed direction slightly because this is uh, because of this, I want to give you a right of reply to claims about your videos regarding Xinjiang and your recent trip. We wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to claims that you visited Xinjiang and provided an exclusive interview with CGTN. 
We also want to give the opportunity to provide a right to reply to claims that you are suspected of cooperating with the state media outlets and that you spread Chinese government disinformation. If you wish to provide me with a right of reply, then please let me know. Otherwise, I will say in the piece that we approached you for comment. My last and final reply to her was, one, no Western media outlet approached me for an interview after my viral video. Only Chinese media had an interest, but I limited my appearances to one. I would have gone on more shows had there been non-Chinese based outlets interested. Western media is disinterested to do a recorded interview with me because it's slightly more difficult to take out of context than just answering superficial written questions for a predetermined hit piece without a chance for interaction. I can very easily prove this true right now. I'll offer you a recorded interactive interview with you on this topic. Do you accept? Two, I'll happily answer any and all of your questions in written format if you answer the questions about BBC's exposed lies and deceit, which is relevant to the very topic you'd like to discuss. If you are refusing to answer the question that 4,000 plus other people have also demanded an answer to, I'll still happily answer your questions in a video interview format. I received no further reply after this. You know, I, I wasn't included in this article. I, I, I could easily walk away at this point after having dodged a bullet and not being targeted, um, not having BBC smear me. You know, if this was only about me and my own best interests, that's exactly what I would do. But I'm not. So here I am exposing them. And once again, I publicly ask both of you, Sophie Williams and Carrie Allen, to explain the BBC's uncritical pushing and mass promotion of a ridiculously whole-filled testimony that your outlet retweeted over half a dozen times in a 24-hour period in a coordinated blitz with CNN, who took it one step further and blurred out Tersonay's passport renewal date after they realized we exposed that her story had a massive hole in it. There were over 4,000 people who signed a petition before it was mysteriously deleted asking your outlet the same questions. You are with BBC. You had an open and direct line of communication with me, but you are staring right at this issue, this massive issue presented to you on a silver platter, and you're refusing to even acknowledge that it exists. In my recent tweet to you, I helped even dumb this down for you to try to save some time for you and give you a multiple choice option. Do you refuse to address this massively whole-filled testimony the BBC uncritically pushed to the world because A, you don't care. B, you don't see an issue here. C, you're knowingly engaging in disinformation. Or D, other. You know, the truth is, no matter what you say, nothing will save you from the fact that your outlet has already published this testimony without even half a percent of the digging and stretching and desperate peppering of pessimistic conclusions that you used against these so-called pro-China YouTubers. No, you really tried here to maintain the status quo narrative, didn't you, Sophie Williams and Carrie Allen? In fact, you took your eagerness to shill for your paymasters and to advance your careers by supporting British and American state-sanctioned narratives to another level, didn't you, Sophie and Carrie? Not only, not only did you not address any of our actual arguments, not only do you refuse to take a look at our claims, not only do you refuse to mention in your article about theorized and possible conflicts of interest, the actual proven conflicts of interest we usually bring up in regards to U.S. State Department and or military industrial complex funded narratives against China. Oh, you went way further. You, did, you decided to get a person literally soaking in U.S. State Department funds from every possible imaginable angle to weigh in and help you out on your story and your preferred narrative. You decided to get Robert Potter to weigh in and support your theories. Robert is a subject matter expert at CRDF Global, a U.S. State Department and Department of Defense funded organization. Robert also writes for ASPI, a U.S. State Department and military industrial complex funded outlet that pushes China threat stories and profits from subsequent China threat prevention. Robert is also the co-CEO of Internet 2.0, a company he hopes to take public and whose biggest client is the U.S. State Department.
Congratulations, Sophie Williams and Carrie Allen. You took your shilling to a whole new level. Now, I want to be clear about something to everybody. I don't entirely discredit people like Potter based on this alone. I, I usually try to dig deeper into what they're actually saying, but I'm not going to do that here because the main point here is to show this glaring hypocrisy and desperate piece of so-called journalism that lacks any honesty, integrity, logic, or consistency. Sophie Williams and Carrie Allen are the kinds of journalists who are attack dogs for their paymasters, set onto anyone who dares say anything in opposition to or challenging the leading mainstream media narratives. They are designed to fear others into behaving and staying in line because some people don't live in China and work regular jobs and might be afraid to lose relationships when they've got to explain to their friends or employers why a major news outlet thinks they're connected to the Chinese government or part of a coordinated campaign against the West just because they're speaking up. I know many people like this who stay quiet for this very reason. Sophie Williams and Carrie Allen are the kinds of journalists who create material required to commit real genocides around the world and consent over and over again. I'll provide you a with a link to a Twitter thread where I explain and illustrate this idea in a little bit more depth. Just take a look down in the description. From here, once again, for a deeper dive into the actual specifics surrounding what's wrong with this article, uh, you know, I'll provide a link over to Brian's video on the uh, new Atlas channel. And I'll also share a link to Barry's video response where he talks about the answers that he gave to BBC's questions. I think the Barrett channel will also do a response video. Once that comes out, I will also put the link in the description. What was interesting for me was that Barry had some great answers and Lee Barrett just refused to answer their bad faith questions to begin with. But these journalists simply said that they were evasive when they ask questions, deliberately trying to paint them as people with something to hide in order to help paint the picture they'd like to paint and push their audience towards the conclusions that they hope for them to conclude. You guys might think I'm being a little bit harsh here on these poor journalists just trying to get ahead, but these are exactly the kinds of people who help pave the way for real atrocities, for real genocides, and for the mass suffering of innocent people over and over again. Again, follow the links I'll share. If I shared some of the images here I use when illustrating this point, my video will become immediately age-restricted here. At this point, I'm just going to end this video with a prediction. The BBC, nor any of its journalists, will ever address the Tersenay story and the lack of due diligence, or of course, potentially the deliberate omissions they made in that testimony that they published and pushed. They will stare these questions right in the face, and they'll do nothing more than quietly squirm in their seats, recognizing that unfortunately even their silence shines a bright light on their despicable grift. But because they put their personal careers above global human suffering, and because they've trained themselves to ignore the immense shame respectable human beings should be feeling by this point in time, They'll also ignore that light glaring at them from behind their shoulders as they're hunched over writing their next piece, knowing full well how full of crap they are and their outlets are and the human suffering that they've decided to cheerlead for personal gain.